Hello, I'm Mike Browning and this is Let God Speak. Today, we want to outline the main message of the book of Hebrews. Unsurprisingly, the focus of Hebrews is Jesus, who he was and is, and what that means to us. So open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews and prepare to meet Jesus. Well, folks, on our panel today, we have Stephen Groom and Pastor John Cosma. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. We really appreciate your input today. Thank you. We would like to invite everybody to pray with us before we start today. Dear Lord in heaven, we want to thank you so much for all that you do to bless our lives and uh, how much we need your Holy Spirit to help us to understand the scripture and the, particularly the book of Hebrews today. We want to see the role of Jesus in that book today and I pray that you'll guide us here in the studio and those who are at home watching and listening. So thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right now, the Jewish believers, this is the Hebrews, of course, they were experiencing serious trials for their faith. And so the Apostle Paul writes this book to them, this letter, uh, to encourage them to remain steadfast and faithful. And the question we want to address, Stephen, first of all, is how does he go about doing that, encouraging their faith? Okay, to answer that, I'd first like to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 8 yes. and verse 1. And the author Paul writes that, now this is the main point or the, the, the summary of the things that we are saying. We have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And so... He reminds them that the promises of God will be fulfilled through, through, uh, through Jesus, yeah. who, not an ordinary high priest from the Aaronic uh, priesthood, but, um, but by Jesus, who after completing his sacrifice on earth, went and sat at the right hand of the Father and who will one day take us home. But in the meantime, um, Jesus mediates the Father's blessings to us. Okay, yeah, and so we need to hold fast to these promises and stay faithful. It's very encouraging in the fact that he's on the throne yes. with the Father. I mean, that makes him in a very powerful position. Um, John, why is it so important for us to note that Jesus is a ruler, our ruler, basically the world's ruler? We've got to remember that when Adam and Eve sinned, in effect, they handed over the rulership of this world to someone else yeah. because they had given themselves over to the work of Satan. And this is alluded to in John chapter 12 and verse 31. Reading from the New King James Version. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And then again, in John chapter 14, you, you find here in verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you, said Jesus, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Mm, that's amazing, isn't it? So he acknowledged Satan as the ruler of the world. Oh, yes. Jesus knew full well what had happened. Mm. And so he came to challenge that. Yeah, no, thanks. What a blessing. Yeah, absolutely. Here, here the disciple John is actually writing about the coming cosmic judgment mm. that is going to take place. OK, so that's another dimension. Oh, yes. Again. Yes, yes. So how did Jesus take the world back on our behalf, Stephen? Well, Satan's character, who is the enemy of Jesus, his character was fully uh, revealed at, at the cross. His malignity against Jesus was unmasked and he, um, his sympathies of the universe uh, separated from him. And so Jesus was then recovered the, the right to rule the world as the new second Adam on, on our behalf. Um, I'd like to go to 1 Corinthians 15 verses 45, 47 and 49. And here we have a, a, a comparison that 
between Jesus and the and the Adam. Yes. And it says that and so is written the first Adam became a living being, but the last Adam, who is Jesus, became a life giving spirit. Forty seven. The first Adam was was of the earth, made of dust. The second Adam is the Lord from heaven. So here we were revealed Jesus' origin. He was God in heaven. Okay. And secondly, as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, that is the original Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So this is important. So if we're raised again in newness of life, we will bear that Jesus image. Okay, and so Jesus became our representative. The original Adam failed. Yes. He comes as the second Adam to succeed in leading us. Yes, um, and, and so we have us. two ways to go. We can stay in that fallen state or we can now take hold of the new That's Adam. good. That's tremendous. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. And uh, this is why, of course, that Jesus is able to say that the meek shall inherit the earth um, because he has the right to give it to him. He will because he has taken back leadership of the earth. Now, that's really fantastic. Thank you for that. Look, I'd like us to look at Hebrews chapter one, if we could for a moment, folks. Hebrews chapter one and verse five. There are some, a few verses here I'd like to read. And Hebrews chapter one is describing who Jesus was and is. And so we need to um, understand what he's saying here. So Hebrews chapter one, first of, first of all, verse five, to which of the angels did he ever say, that is, did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Now we're going to come back and address these points in a moment. Verse six, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Another dimension of Jesus and who he was and who he is. And then verse eight, to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Sitting on the throne. And then in verse 10, it says, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hand. So we're learning some very important factors about who Jesus actually is here. So, John, what do you see happening here? In Hebrews chapter one, verse six. And I read when he. Again, brings the firstborn into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. Yeah. Now, time and again in the Bible, we are not to worship angels. Well, then who is Jesus? Mm -hmm. And it goes on to say, let the angels of God worship him. And then verse 10, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Yeah. We are going to make an agreement with God mm -hmm. in the book of Hebrews, but we are not making it with an angel. Mm. or some created being. The agreement that we make here in the book of Hebrews is actually an agreement with God. The creator himself. Yeah, nice. The creator. Thank you for that, And John. all the angels yeah. and the universe worships him. So we are making an agreement here with the Supreme. Okay, thank you, John, for the beautiful insight. Um, what other astounding things do, um, do you pick up here out of this? It, in verse eight, it says that but unto the Son, he says, who is Jesus, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. So the scepter is what a ruler rules with. Yeah. And so as a throne, he's a king that sits upon the throne and he rules in perfect righteousness, something that is mostly absent from earthly rulers, as we're probably noticing that's true, yeah. during our lifetime. Yeah, yeah. And Hebrews 4.16, just over the page, we, it also says that his throne is a throne of grace where we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that's very important when we're going through struggles or bad times yeah. that God is there to help us. And it's the throne of grace. That's the throne that Jesus is sitting on. Yes. Um, the creator, as you pointed out, John. Yes. Um, so we may come to that throne and find help. That's He's really sitting important. on the mercy seat in, in sanctuary language. OK, thank you for that. Appreciate that very much. Look, we've, we've just dealt with Hebrews chapter 10, uh, chapter 5, verse 10, John. I want to add something to that. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. It reminds me of the hymn. Mm -hmm. My maker and my king. 
to thee, my all I own, Mm. because he is our maker and our king. And so we even sing about it in Christianity. We do. What a wonderful song. It is. Thank you for bringing it to our attention Mm. today. You know, one of the interesting features of Jesus' identity is that he was to be a descendant of King David of Israel. This is very important in terms of understanding of the, of the fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus carried out in his life. So, Stephen, what is the significance of the fact that he was a descendant of King David? He would fulfill all the great promises made to David or King David and his yes. descendants. And I'd like to go to 2 Samuel um, chapter 7 and verses 12, 13. And it says... When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I'll set up your seed after you, that seed meaning descendants, who will establish your kingdom. Verse 13, um, he will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this can't be an earthly ruler. It has to be the ultimate seed who is Jesus, who fulfills that, isn't it? I will be his father and he shall be my son. And verse 16, once again, it says your throne will be established forever. So he's reiterating the fact that one of his seed will rule forever on the throne of David. And this is um, fulfilled by Jesus. Okay. And, and yeah. That's, and this, that's fantastic. So, yes, and, go on. And the writer of, of Hebrews, Paul, reiterates this. He says his throne in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 8, his throne would last forever. Okay, so so the connection is very clear. Um, That's really interesting. Unfortunately, of course, many of the kings of Israel who descended from David later came on the scene. um, They were unfaithful to God and led the people astray, um, which was really sad. Um, And it looked as though the promises were about to fail that God made about a descendant of David living forever. Um, Did it fail? John, that's the question. That is a good question. Mm. Fortunately, the answer here is in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 32, uh, verse 30. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Mm. Sometimes blind people have a better understanding (laughs) Than those How blind can you get? Yes, it's it's the blind leading the blind. Except <laughs> that these blind were spiritually equipped. Yeah. It's, so it's better to be physically blind but spiritually awake. Yes, mm. spiritually blind and physically. And so spiritual. here they they called him the son of David. Where did they get that idea from? Mm. So it was an Old Testament concept that a son of David was going to come, and he was going to fulfil the promises of God. And fortunately. He did. Verse 31, then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Twice. And it's not in our lesson, but Mm. fortunately, they received back their sight, Mm. literally. And so here they had two lots of insight. What a blessing. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. that was a blessing. Look, a related thought this time um, is in Revelation chapter five and verse five. And it says this. Now, we can't go into the whole of that, that particular prophecy of chapter five. And it's very fascinating. But verse five is, is interesting. It says, one of the elders said to me, that's one of the angels who was with John, who was receiving this village vision. And the angel said, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals, which had to do with the destiny of mankind. But the interesting thing is that this reference to the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, What is the message here, Steve? Well, uh, lion signifies strength, but coming from the tribe of Judah, he really, according to the Jewish laws, was not supposed to be a priest, was he? Um, That was given to the tribe of Levi. Originally, it was the firstborn of every family, but because of the apostasy at Sinai, it was given to the tribe of Levi, who was faithful. However, Jesus has become the priest from the tribe of Judah, so to speak. And, and as um, interestingly enough, as, as being the root of David, as it says in this text. Mm. So, and Jesus pointed out in Matthew 22, verse 45, that Jesus is both the origin of David in that he created him 
And he's also the offspring as Jesus being the descendant from David. Which is an incredible thing to think about, isn't it? Yeah. He was both the, he was both he was the creator and his offspring. Yes. If that doesn't make us realize who we are dealing with here more than a human being, then we're dealing with the life of Jesus. OK, let's move on here. Um, in ancient Israel, the, like the faithfulness of the kings had quite an impact on the actual people themselves, didn't it, John? Yes. How faithful they were influenced the people. Oh, it's true today, too. Mm. A nation appoints a leader and lo and behold, he takes them wherever or she. <laughs> That's true. And so that is not new. But here, because of who Jesus is, we've been given a promise in Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. If children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, then we may also be glorified together. Yes. And so after suffering will mm. come glory. And we are fellow heirs. That means everything that is his is also ours. He shares yes. his people. And Jesus said to take up thought. the cross. That it involves suffering, doesn't it? To, okay. to follow in Jesus' steps. All right. It takes a certain commitment to follow him. That's what you're saying. Yes. And it's so true. That is the case. Um, so he's our king. As our king, um, what specifically does he do for us? We've mentioned a number of things here, but in your mind, what specifically does he do for us as our king, Steve? He takes up the spiritual battle for us uh, okay. in this life. And, and I'd like to turn to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15. And it says, Inasmuch as then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he, Jesus himself, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus partook of flesh and blood like we. He mm. showed us how to overcome in his name, in the Father's name, mm. and then set an example for us we have through the scriptures. We can follow in his steps and we don't have to really fear death. It's just for the believer, it's asleep before the resurrection and we can be taken okay. to heaven with him. Fantastic. So he's the champion of the week. If that represents you and me, we know where to go uh, to gain the help that we need. OK, thinking back on King David. Um, in his life, John, he he um, he demonstrated for us some of the things that Jesus was going to do. He was a type of Christ in many respects, wasn't he, in the way that he lived his life? As a boy. We find that he. <laughs> As, as, as a boy, we find that he was a, a born champion. Yes. When he heard Goliath. The giant. Yes. And the giant said, OK, I win. You come join our side. Mm. And David could, could wear that. Mm. And he, slew, uh, he threw his stone, hit yeah. Goliath where? On the forehead. Not on the forehead. Yes. Yeah, and so here... He became the conqueror and Jesus on our behalf does the same. OK, he will fight the battle. But he, those battles, we fight a more spiritual battles rather than very much physical. So. physical that's we, that's we don't throw stones. No. Yeah. <laughs> and so David acted as a representative for all of our for all of Israel. And Jesus mm. does our combat. He's yes. comp oh, that's fantastic. So we're not yes. left to our own devices. So we're, we're in a spiritual warfare. Are we with spirits? We can't. We see. are. We are. There's a beautiful promise. Some will know this in Isaiah 49, verse 25, which says, Thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. The prey of the terrible will be delivered. Good news. For I will contend with him who contends with you and I will save your children. So is Isaiah addressing our situation as well here, then, Stephen? I, I just read um, before Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, where it says um, it makes it clear that Jesus defends his people, us yeah. and our children. So Jesus is there for us. OK, that's really fantastic, isn't it? Um, I'm just going to read a scripture from um, Ephesians chapter 6. If um, you'd like to join with me at Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to read verse... Um, verse 10 through to 12 there. Um, he, Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. This is what it says. Finally, my brethren, 
Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Notice that, his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Um, So is Isaiah addressing, and of course, Ephesians here, uh, John, um, what's, what is his message to us? I mean, he's, he's got a, a very powerful message here. Two things. One is faith. And the second thing is prayer. Yeah. Because faith is our protection. Yes. And prayer is our weapon. Mm. And that's how in the armour of God, we can be given the victory through Christ. Yes, and and the word is the sword. Absolutely. Yeah, no, fanta- that's fantastic. Look, um, there's another aspect of Jesus' life that I'd like us to address now. It's found in Hebrews chapter five, verse five. It was also found earlier, but we'll read it from chapter five, verse five. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, "You are my son. Today I have begotten you." And then he goes into the next verse and says. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, um, so what is this saying to us here? What is Paul's point here, Steve? Well, uh, the the high priesthood of of Christ is a major theme in the book of Hebrews, isn't it? Mm, And and so um, David was from the tribe of Judah. And as already pointed out, he was not able to be a priest because he was from the line of Judah, as was Jesus. However, Jesus came from the tribe of, um, but Jesus came after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, And so this is expanded in chapter seven. And I'd like just to read verse three, where it it connects Melchizedek with Jesus. It's saying of the original king of Salem, says he was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginnings of days nor end of life but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, if that's not describing Jesus to the core, I don't know. Well, the reality is we know nothing about Melchizedek. He wasn't of the tribe of Judah or Levi. Yes. um, But he was a king, king of the city of Salem, which later became Jerusalem. And he was also a priest of the most. And so he was a type of, so Jesus was a type of this original. That's right. um, King Melchizedek. Melchizedek was actually a type. Yes, that's correct. And uh, Jesus was also to be priest and king. It's very interesting the way that's put together there for us. So thank you for that. Um, According to the book of Hebrews, John, what was the chief role of the high priest? We'll have to keep moving along, gentlemen, now. The the chief role of the high priest is summarised in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Mm -hmm. So as a high priest, Jesus did everything when it came to the temple services. Okay, thank you for that. Now, gentlemen, we're going to have to jump a bit of information here on account of we're running out of time fast. I'm going to go now to um, Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm going to read verse 19 and 20, and I'm going to come back to you on that one, Stephen, if I may. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, um, and we'll have a look at what this tells us about Jesus. Chapter 10, 19, this is what it says. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, referring, of course, to the holy place in the sanctuary in heaven, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil, that is his flesh. So what is this telling us about Jesus here? Here we have um, sanctuary language. Mm-hmm. So the veil was there, the entering into the, mo- the holy and the most holy place. Yeah. And Jesus has become that veil through his victory. We now have uh, entrance into, the, into his presence, into the uh, sanctuary in heaven through, through his work. And, and that aligns with um, the, the gospel to the very presence of God. So we can, that's the fantastic thing, isn't it? Yeah. Through him, we go into the very, very and, presence of God. Into and because himself. of that, by faith, by faith, we take hold of that claim. And in Acts 17, 27, sums it up saying that 
He, Jesus, is not very far away from us. Okay, thank you for that. Now, John, just quickly here, um, what is the significance of Jesus entering into the holiest, which would be the most holy place? The significance is that Jesus went into the presence of his Father. Yes. And therein lies the power of our prayer, because through Christ we are actually in the presence of God. In the presence of the Almighty. And he's the one who hears us, mm. and he is the Almighty One. Okay, thank you for that. That's, a, that's so true, and it's a very powerful thought indeed. Um, the power of prayer coming, it takes us into the presence of God. Mm. Yes. And the wonder is that we don't pray more than we do. Um, because what an enormous privilege it is that we can do that, and it's because of Jesus that we can. Look, I'm going to go to Hebrews um, chapter 8 now. Hebrews chapter 8, and I'm going to read verse 8 and verse 10 here, and then come back to you, Stephen, if we can. Yep. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. Um, this is a reference now to the covenant and that was established between God and, and Israel, and of course then with spiritual Israel, the Christian church today. And verse 8, it says, But finding fault with them, referring to ancient Israel here, finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And then he describes the covenant in verse 10. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So what is this saying to us here, Steve? Uh, this is the new covenant. Interestingly, this is quoting from the Old Testament. So the yeah. new covenant is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 33, mm -hmm. and repeated in Hebrews chapter 10, actually. But Jesus is saying they found fault with them, that is, they were given the stones, the tables of stone, yeah. but they couldn't keep it. But the new covenant is God writing the law on our heart. On our heart so that we love to, to, do, to do his will and obey him. That's a fantastic thought to finish on. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Folks, here we stand on the borders of the promised land. We have all the privileges that Jesus won for us in single-handed combat with the evil one. So armed with faith and prayer and the sword of the Spirit, we can all move forward together as Jesus leads the way. Well, we're glad you joined us together on Let God Speak. You can watch all our past programs on our website, 3abnaustralia.org.au. You can download Teachers Helps there. You can email us if you would like to do, do so. And we'd like to, you to join us again next time. God bless. You have been listening to Let God Speak, a production of 3ABN Australia Television. To catch up on past programs, please visit 3abnaustralia.org.au. Call us in Australia on 02 4973 3456 or email radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We'd love to hear from you.